much. So we'll just go straight into um, our speaker. Normally I give the highlights of what the Donebrook Watershed Port Partnership as an organization has done in the last 12 months. But when uh, Daryl Haddock and I were speaking on the phone, we got sort of so excited about all our collective watershed work and he was saying he has an extra special um, way of communicating kind of exactly what is a watershed after all. Um, that was something again to Dorothy Adams point she was interested in making sure that we just start right there. So he is going to kick it off tonight um, and I'll just tell you a couple things about the myriad of uh, activities this guy is involved in and we're just so happy that um, he came to Cleveland for this big birthday party that we've thrown for him. It's his birthday. <laughs> and um, we, no, we do appreciate um, him coming. I, I, I think his, he said his dog and his youngest daughter were really upset. <laughs> <laughs> and the only one that had the, 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 the sad <laughs> So, so Daryl is um, an environmental education director for the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. He coordinates their education programs, community outreach, citizen science, research activity, and participates in WAWA. WAWA is kind of appropriate, actually. Day-to-day -day operations. He completed his uh, he, he completed Jacksonville University with a BA in geography and graduated from Georgia State University with a master's degree in geoscience and applied GIS. Daryl has worked over 20 years, um, of, has 20 years of professional experience as an environmental scientist working for a consulting firm uh, and also as a principal investigator with the USGS on a subsurface mapping project. Okay, we're going to get to the good stuff in a minute. <laughs> um, but he has recently for really re received national recognition from Audubon Society and, and the US EPA as a, an environmental education fellow and has um, been named the, an ambassador for Proctor Creek in Atlanta. And I think it's really with that inspired and passion work that he's, um, he's going to be talking about tonight. So welcome, Daryl. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for the warm welcome on such a uniquely cold day. <laughs> uh, when I left Atlanta, it was 20-something degrees. I got off the plane, it was like, what, 18, 20-something degrees up here. So um, I'm glad I reminded myself to bring a coat. Because uh, I'm really from New Jersey, so you may hear that. So I give you kind of this disclaimer up front that every now and again, uh, the Jersey slips out. Uh, and to be completely transparent, um, as one of my exercises, I guess, in accountability, and uh, I'm not from Atlanta, right? And, and so I stand on the shoulders of the community in which I work in. And I tell people all the time that I leverage my wife's street cred because she's from Atlanta, right? And so in Atlanta, you have to, you know, Sharon, you gotta be kind of uniquely connected uh, in order to get recognized in some circles. It's kind of what church you go to, what fraternity or sorority you belong to, you know, so you have to know how to leverage some of your identities and those things that you bring with you uh, as you do community-based work. Uh, and so certainly I celebrate the fact that, you know, I've done uh, and continue to do amazing work with the residents of the Proctor Creek Watershed and the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. And hopefully you'll be able to see a little bit about how we've done community engagement uh, in, in Atlanta. So some of you may understand, could you have a consent degree here, that where we started was about 1996. And uh, we were not meeting our water quality standards, the Clean Water Act standards. And so our combined sewers were just pouring out um, high counts of E. coli bacteria into the Chattahoochee River. Um, in other rivers subsequently. Atlanta, most of our river systems are on the periphery of the city. Our creeks and streams are downtown that connect to our river systems. And so it's the communities through which that <coughs> pollution and pathogen mix was moving through before it got to the Chattahoochee River. So we laud the uh, efforts of the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper who sued the city and created one of the first consent decrees uh, that we had nationally. But certainly the work wasn't done when we got to um, the downstream impacts. We started to have to work in the communities upstream to help build capacity for them to understand what was happening to them 
and how were they experiencing these negative impacts of the combined sewer. And so a lot of times the flooding that we experience in Atlanta because people look at us as being a city in the mountains, right? We have trees, so they're like, well, how, do, how are you flooding? You know, th this is the mountains. You know, what is causing you all to flood so poorly in especially communities of color? So really it's not water inundation, it's catastrophic infrastructure failure, right? That's really what is happening. And so we had to engage people because a lot of times our municipal processes are not necessarily front facing to address community engagement. We see oftentimes, and I say we, you know, our utilities sometimes see engagement as an opportunity to check the box, right? And so we need to, to do is push for a deeper opportunity to get communities engaged and to participate in the solutions. And although our mayors, and we had a mayor, Shirley Franklin, that certainly had to stand up and kind of take the hit, you know, financially and, and pretty much for her career. Uh, for, for counting herself as a sewer mayor, um, she essentially had to move us into a new paradigm of addressing our storm orders. And so we've got these major sewer system vaults or tunnels um, that ring the city and catch our storm water. But because of our flashy flows, we still have urban flooding that occurs in our communities where raw and treated sewage finds its way in our floorboards, of our homes, in parks, in schoolyards, on playing fields. And so it's addressing that almost third world condition that really led to the work that Wawa does. Don't forget the watershed part. I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> so I didn't wanna assume, I don't wanna assume that you all know what a watershed is. And because I'm an environmental educator, I ask for this small indulgence, okay? So because I work with kids all the time, I ask children to make a bowl with their hands. So everybody do me a favor. Everybody make a bowl with your hand. Make a little bowl, right? And imagine it's raining into your hands, right? And so as the raindrops fall, they're going to hit the rings of your bowl, correct? And where are they going to go? Where's the rain going to go? Down the sides of the bowl. And then, so as the bowl fills up, the nooks and crannies of your hand become the creeks and streams and rivers, right? And so the center of your hand becomes maybe a central water body. So a lot of times people don't understand that watersheds are the land that supports bodies of water. So sometimes we assume, perhaps incorrectly, that watersheds are involving the water. Does that make sense? Yeah. But really watersheds are the land which the water drops are moving across till they get to the lowest spot that is where the water is formed. And so a lot of times people ask us, well, why, why, why are you all a watershed alliance? Why aren't you a water keeper? Or why aren't you a water organization? And we say, well, everything happens in the watershed. Right? We can talk about housing, because housing happens in the watershed, right? Ecological <laughs> services happen in the watershed. Crime, unfortunately, happens in the watershed, right? So we can have a broader conversation. We can have more colors to paint with. We could be uh, more involved in social action, because we're not just solely going to address water quality issues. And I think that that's been one of the keys to our success, is it allows us to not be siloed and our approaches because it forces us to think outside of the box. So that watershed exercise, thank you for allowing me to use that kind of, but that's kind of what I do in terms of a K to gray approach to environmental education, right? We educate everybody, right? And we don't assume that just because we're adults that we understand it, right? Because we don't want to assume. Because some of this stuff is too, it's jargony, right? It's academic, right? It's science. And a lot of times we get nervous you know, with science, especially sometimes in communities of color. You know, we don't always feel comfortable. And so we have to oftentimes demystify the jargon to work in our community, to remind our communities that the work that we do is culturally relevant, culturally responsive work. You are a part of the work because certainly as people of color and as, and as indigenous, indigenous people, they're earth people. We're all earth people. You know, if we kind of strip away the trappings of society and culture and civilization, we all work the land, right? And so it's in our DNA to understand these concepts. But somewhere, you know, we get sophisticated and we don't feel connected to nature in the ways that perhaps we used to, right? Or it's not as fun and exciting because we turn it into math and science, right? So when we're kids, <laughs> you know, when we're kids, we love it, right? We're flipping logs, we're looking for roly polies, we're having a great time. And then somebody tells you, 
that's science, right? <laughs> you know, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, we get we get nervous, right? And we get we get anxious, and so you know, we've got to figure out a way how to make citizen science, community science, and environmental education fun and relevant, and kind of sprinkled in with recreational activities like camping and biking and hiking and kayaking so that you can create multiple entry points for communities to, uh, to approach and to be stewards uh, in their communities. So a lot of the work that we do is around community science. And one of the important reasons why I feel as though we use community science as one of our major entry points is because oftentimes when um, agencies and municipalities and staff come to communities, they see communities as the angry people. Right? And so there's that immediate barrier of, oh my God, you know, we got to go to that meeting and we're going to have to report to them and they're not going to want to hear what we say and they're going to be mad, you know, and then, you know, the tables are going to get flipped, you know, and they're going to run us on our ears, you know. And so a lot of times our municipal partners, especially in our water utility, didn't want to come and report out in our communities about the projects that they had. I mean, and when they did, they, 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 you could visibly see the tension and anxiety, and they were out of there before they finished their complete report, right? <laughs> you, you know, and so they didn't want to kind of update us on what was happening with this, the tunnel projects, or, you know, how do we get more green infrastructure, or they really didn't want to do the deep community engagement because they were afraid of the community people. You know, and so we said, well, how are we going to change this paradigm? You know, we, we can't have elected officials afraid to engage their constituents. That, that's ridiculous. You know, and uh, many of these elected officials of color came from the very neighborhoods and drive through the very neighborhoods that they're running from. You know, and so we said to come up with kind of a new approach. And so one of the things that we started to value was community or citizen based science. The research that allows community members to participate in the data collection but also uniquely to be seen as researchers, right? So if you're seen as a researcher sharing your data, it doesn't come with the baggage of you being angry. You're just stating the facts, right? You just say, hey, it's this many parts per billion of what I found in my backyard, do something about it, right? <laughs> you know, and it, it really changed the perception of the way communities were perceived by the local government and eventually by the federal government. So eventually we got the success of being named an urban water federal partner location for Proctor Creek. And I believe one of the reasons why was because we did that deep dive into community engagement through the citizen science work. We also created something called a stewardship council, which I, you know, unapologetically say I stole, right? It was an idea that I was in a learning community and somebody told me, hey, you know, there are all kind of watershed uh, stewardship councils across the country. And I said, wow, what are they? And they said, well, they're community action groups. You know, they're just stakeholder teams. They're, you know, impromptu boards, you know. It's just a loose configuration of neighborhoods and leaders that want to speak on certain issues. And I said, well, I think we need to do that because we're not getting anywhere just talking to our elected officials. You know, we talk to our city council persons, our mayor, or our watershed superintendents. And unfortunately, it never filters down, right? So we had to build a coalition of people that we invested in to educate them on their own issues, to empower them so that they have the capacity to speak for themselves. And I just had the benefit of stepping out the way. You know, and so I allowed that core team to, to, to speak in their own voices. And so uniquely enough, we brought that team here to River Rally this past summer. And that's where they saw me and invited me to come speak, right? <laughs> you know, but it, I don't think the thing that impressed anyone was necessarily my presentation. It really was the fact that we bought six other community members and they did the PowerPoint themselves. You know, and so building again the accountability that allows me to be a two-way gatekeeper. Like I recognize my role to be present here, right? And to certainly get into rooms that oftentimes people who look like me don't oftentimes get the chance to get into. But if I'm not accountable, right? If I'm not connected to somebody, you know, I could get the big head, right? And oftentimes what happens with our leaders is, right, they get so far and disconnected from their communities that they get out there and they get so far afield of their community that they're alone, right? And they turn around and say, well, come on, you know, come on, y'all. You know, and where are they, right? They're back in the neighborhood. So if you're not standing on the shoulders of somebody, then you're disconnected from that community. You know, and oftentimes you've got to remind yourself, how effective am I at my organizing? Right? You know, how effective am I? If I can't get a person to come to a meeting, is that their fault or is that my fault? Right? Right? And so oftentimes we 
create all of these opportunities to meet with people. And then we start to get mad at them because they don't come to our meeting, right? And we blame them. We say, oh, man, they, they, they don't care about these issues. No, you are not a good organizer. <laughs> you know, you're just not a good organizer, right? And so you got to learn how to have effective organizing strategies. So that's, that's what we did, you know. Okay, so, um, so after the citizen science, we began the deep work in community organizing. And I admit that I'm a reluctant organizer. I'm a scientist, right? I am not a community organizer. And so I did not have the, the, the skills and the tools to organize, right? I didn't know how to go. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know how to go into communities and hit the streets and knock on doors and, and give and take surveys. I like to ride around in the state truck, roll up on people, and just bogart in and take inspections, right? <laughs> right? Because right? I, I work for the state, you know, in my professional capacity, or I work for an engineering firm. Like, I didn't have to tell anybody what I was doing, you know, and so I, I, that was a little power trip I was on, you know? <laughs> you know? And, and that privilege allowed me to see why our strategies don't work in communities, right? Because we are afraid to just take off the privilege and meet people where they are and build the relationships that it really takes to do the work. You know, and essentially, you know, changing that strategy for me and allowing me to grow in, at that uncomfortable edge of my professional development has made me a much more, albeit reluctant, organizer, right? <laughs> I'm much better at it. <laughs> um, I make a lot of mistakes, but I think the most important thing about my work is that I'm accountable to somebody. So when I mess up, I got, you know, Miss Juanita, right, or somebody that's going to, like, say, Daryl, I saw you on TV, man, what was up with you? You know, <laughs> you know, what did you say that for? <laughs> you know, and so I'm, I'm uniquely accountable to my community. I've got people in my church, you know, that check me when I come in on Sunday, like, we saw you out there, you, you know what I mean? And so I think you have to have that, you know, connection that allows you to foster the real relationships that really help you do the work. The other advantage that we have is we have a space. Um, we have a nature center um, called the Outdoor Activity Center. Um, we have a unique relationship with the City of Atlanta Parks Department. Uh, this nature center is 26 acres inside the West End, the west side of the city. Um, it's an old growth forest. Uh, it's in a declining, well, formerly declining uh, part of the city. Now we're undergoing some development pressure and, and, and we're starting to see uh, gentrification push the property values in uh, this community from about 20 to 30,000 up to about half a million dollars. So we've got our second half a million dollar house about two blocks from this facility. Um, and most of the residents of this particular neighborhood live in one and a half bath, maybe three bedroom, two bedroom bungalows, right? Shotgun homes. Um, and so these are homes that were probably um, GI Bill homes that were built probably in the, the late 30s and 40s. And so the fact that people can come from California because now we got this new movie industry and decide that they can drop, you know, a half a million dollars or more on a house that probably should be 10 G's, uh, is shocking to me. <laughs> you know, it's really shocking. But it shows you how people from outside can come in and radically alter the development and urbanization patterns of your community. And it doesn't take long for that to happen. Uh, and so the one thing that we're doing in this space is preserving green space and advocating for green space and actually doing some land stewardship by acquiring green space. Uh, and so we're working to get communities involved with land trusts and other uh, opportunities so that we can hold on to the things that we consider are viable for our ecological services um, in the community. Um, this is our mission. I don't have to read it, but you can certainly read it. Um, but we really, really embedded in our mission this notion that this is about preserving um, the environment for all, right? That environmental justice is something that just doesn't happen to people who have color, right? Environmental justice happens to Appalachian communities. It happens to communities out west. It happens to indigenous communities. And if we can all agree that there are structural and systemic biases that create the disparities in the first place, then I think we can have honest conversations about how to undo or dismantle it. But if we're going to be playing around with the definition, you know, if we're going to say things like, oh, well, you know, they should just, why don't they, why don't they just fix this themselves? Or why don't they just get a job? Then we don't really understand the structural and systemic underpinnings that really undermine communities in ways that we need to get a common uh, definition around. Because if we're going to work together and work together as partners, I don't want to herd cats, 
right? I don't want to think that you're under a different definition about what communities are intrinsically. You and I need to have the same definition so that we can create the same strategy, or at least create strategies that play off of each other. And I feel like the work that I do oftentimes with other um, conservation and environmental peer groups is that everybody wants to do great work, but they don't want to sit down and, and foster a common definition about what the work is. You know, what does community mean to you? Can we start with an analysis, a critical analysis, of what is impacting this community? And can we work forward on a strategy that addresses their community needs? As opposed to all of us running around thinking we already understand communities, and we're working in a very disjointed and haphazard fashion, and we're saying that this is good work. Right, this, this is going to have just outcomes, you know, and it just doesn't work that way, you know. And, and we certainly have found that, and I'll say we found that in Atlanta because we got the urban mythology, you know, that we're the city too busy to hate, you know. So if we in the South don't believe that there's structural <laughs> systemic racism in the South, and we're so far above that that we're post racial, then we drink the Kool Aid, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, and, and a lot of people believe these things, you know, and I'm not saying that you have to have, you know, I'm not attacking any ideology, but what I'm saying is, can we come to consensus about the work that we want to do in communities, and you can still have your political beliefs, right, but we have to come to an agreement that these are the outcomes we want to see, despite the belief systems that we have, the political ideologies that we have, and we can do that in partnership and collaboration with each other. Because I can't do it alone, right? And at some point, I want to retire, maybe move to Fiji, like, you know, <laughs> hang out with my family. You know, at some point, I want to kind of move on. And, and interestingly enough, we were talking about succession planning. Um, <laughs> so, so, so this is the definition of environmental justice, for those of you that haven't seen a working definition. Uh, and the reason I put it up here is because one of the things that really speaks to me about it is that we all have to have the belief that we're looking for fair treatment, right? that there's this notion that we can all experience whatever fair treatment is. We don't have to get into who benefits, right? And I know we drill down oftentimes and say, well, I'm, I'm afraid they're gonna come up, right? And I think they, they're gonna have more than me. This is about fair, right? So equity, equity is not equality, right? Equity is not equality. If you look at a numerical statement, the equal sign that's equality. Whatever happens on one side of the equal sign has to happen on the other, right? Equity is how you make it happen, right? How do you make the equality happen is the equity. And you can't do exactly the same thing on both sides of the equal sign, can you? Not really, right? So in order to get equity, it does mean that some, something has to be different for somebody. <laughs> You know, and, and, and oftentimes we get stuck with this, this seeing equality is the synonym to equity. And it's just not, you know. And I think we can be open and transparent to say we can't do everything the same way. We can't keep repeating the same siloed approaches. We can't keep sending out the same messaging. You know, we can't keep doing the same kinds of work and believe that we're really going to move the needle on having an equitable organization, equitable staff equitable boards and equitable communities. Mm -hmm. So the, some of the impact of our work you can see above that we really highlight this obvious uh, approach to environmental education and stewardship. A lot of the, if I had to spell out some specifics about what we do, uh, we host a lot of opportunities to do data collection in our watersheds. Uh, we work with our Chattahoochee River Keeper on something called a river rendezvous uh, and we do a two day a year snapshot where residents go out and collect water quality data from 70 sites throughout the watershed. And then they bring that data back and the Riverkeeper sets up an on-site lab. And we look at that data that day, right? So the data doesn't disappear, right? Because what happens with some of our academic partners, right? They collaborate with us, we hand off the sample, we don't know what happens, they get published, people get rich, you know, I don't know. You know, and we never see that somebody got a you know, PhD, you know, and, and, and the community doesn't benefit in a real sense to that work. Um, another thing, when we do work with academic institutions, we push to have the community scientists be, be co-publishers, right? They get stipends because if we can get paid, they gotta get paid, right? We gotta stop pushing this notion that everybody gonna volunteer. 
right? <laughs> you know, if, 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 I work, if I work an hourly wage, I don't got the kind of income that's going to allow me to volunteer or nothing. You know, I got card, whatever, you know. And so, you know, and, and, and the community folk tell me that all the time. They're like, Daryl, if you call me, you, I need some ends. <laughs> you know, and I said, okay, I'm working on this grant. You know, I got that. I'm working on this leverage. If we can't do a stipend, how about gift cards? How about, you know, Walmart cards? How about groceries? Like, I got a lot of hustles, right, that I'm pulling. <laughs> you know, so, so folks don't, you know, so folks can walk away with something. You know, you know what I'm saying? But that shows that I'm valuing their input and what they're putting in, right? So even if what they they are able to do is get a bag of food and groceries from the farmers market, right? I mean, how hard is that to coordinate, right? How hard is it to, 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 to I mean, we do it for Thanksgiving, you, you know? So, so anyway, we do uh, a lot of that uh, in terms of recognizing community input and community education. Um, we connect urban youth of color through a lot of different uh, service learning opportunities. We're always looking at how we move from recreation and service to service learning and workforce development. Because at the end of the day, we want people to have access to jobs, right? We know the statistics about people of color in the green job market and how to get paid and how the pay disparities are continuing to widen. And the jobs of the future are gonna be well-paying jobs. And we need our young people and our, and our working adults to be a part of that workforce development opportunity. Uh, and so a lot of the work is you know, starting out as conservation core work you know, they may come out and remove invasive plants, they may plant trees, but the goal is always, can we start entrepreneurship opportunities? Can you start a landscape company? Can we scale your, your, your business? You're cutting grass today. Can you become a landscape you know, consultant tomorrow? Can we get you on a contract with the city to manage and maintain green infrastructure? So we're always kind of connecting the dots for people. We may start you here, but there's a trajectory. There's intentional breadcrumbs that we have to lay to move people from one place to another because unfortunately some of our work keeps people where they are, right? And they become consistent and persistent volunteers, right? And then you look up and you say, why aren't you excited? Like you just planted a hundred trees in your community. That's all, you know? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I gotta come back next Saturday and do the same thing. <laughs> you, 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 you know, I mean, and I know we love to work, you know what I'm saying? We love to work. But these are people that have other lives, and lives are, then their lives are being impacted in a lot of ways by social and economic factors. And we have to figure out how we plug workforce into that. Um, most of it, I think, is encouraging youth and adults to be more aware and sensitive to their surroundings. Like, we know what the health data says about communities of color, right? And so one of the things that I oftentimes say about ecological services is why do we want to move the people who are the sickest away from the very free health care that's actually maybe the very thing that's helping them be resilient, right? And so if we allow development, if we allow things to come up and negatively impact the ecological services around communities of color that are suffering, right, in the worst sense about things like asthma and, and, and other healthcare indica health indicators, um, then we're not doing our job, right? You know, that, that's an issue, right? That, that's a quality of life issue. It's a public health issue. And it should be something that we could address through environmental education, recreation, but most certainly just connecting people to nature. Just, just bringing people out. <laughs> Couldn't hear me. Sound like Siri. <laughs> so, so one of the things that we, you know, we, we, we really want to do is make positive connections. And I, and I mentioned this idea of cultural relevance, right? Using historical content and storytelling from these communities of color to preserve their sense of community but also allow them to see themselves as a conservationist, as a nature enthusiast, as a person that feels like nature is something that doesn't make them uncomfortable. Because in a lot of ways, people of color and indigenous people have been erased from the stories of conservation. You know, and so sometimes when conservation groups especially the old conservation groups, you know, my buddies at the Sierra Club, and you know, when they come into the room, they don't understand about the baggage that they come in as privileged white males that are protecting these pristine places for who? You know, and there were people that certainly enjoyed some of those places and they got displaced so that some new people could come in and discover it, right? And that has a context, 
right? D despite the fact that I love the Sierra Club, and I work very closely with groups like the Sierra Club and Trust for Public Lands and Conservation Fund. I work with these groups pushing this idea of equity because we have to understand that, yes, you are doing good work or intend to do good work, but you have some baggage that you're carrying, <laughs> right? And how do we unpack the baggage so that that doesn't hinder your just outcomes when you do the work? Can we sit down and have a conversation that might feel a little prickly, but we can get through it, right? We can get past it, you know? We can certainly understand that where you were is not necessarily where you want to end up. Mm -hmm. Certainly with this notion that we want to be more inclusive as a society. So, you know, this idea of really being aware and sensitive to nature and working with folks to take positive action to become change agents has really been the underpinning of the work that uh, we've done. I'm a member of the Urban Water Federal Partnership. As was mentioned, I'm the Proctor Creek Ambassador. So I received some multi-year funding to serve really as a liaison with the nine federal agencies that are pouring resources into our urban watersheds. Uh, you can see some of the partners. And as I mentioned, it's really difficult to herd the cats. Um, <laughs> but the work that we've done is to really leverage the technical assistance and the funding and the grants so that communities can benefit and understand what's available to them. These are the three watersheds um, in which I work. Uh, so Proctor Creek is the one that's most notably in the news. Um, Utoy Creek is our largest. It's in southwest Atlanta, the Cascade Corridor, for some of you that may know of Atlanta. Uh, 75 and 8, 75, 85 is this corridor. 285 is out here. And so Proctor Creek is the only watershed that is inside the Sea of Atlanta boundary proper. And so we're only dealing with one municipality, which is a great thing, right? Because the other ones I deal with the county, maybe other cities. Um, but we're still doing largely the engagement work in those communities. Um, this is what we do, and I mentioned a lot of our partnerships with the eco, the, the academic institutions, other nonprofits. Um, this is what our, our, our green spaces look like. You know, a lot of times they're, they're dumping grounds. And what I will say is a lot of people might believe that the community is actually doing a lot of the dumping. We have illegal tire sites that have hundreds of thousands of tires on them. Nobody I know has a car with 100,000 tires. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know too many people driving 18 wheelers, but nobody got 100,000 dollars. So anyway, so we, we, we're doing a lot of trail development, a lot of greenway development, and a lot of green infrastructure in our green spaces and organizing communities around that work. Um, obviously, partnerships are important to us. Environmental education, that's our aquaponics system. That's us doing some stream restoration work and taking collecting data. Um, we have a compost system where kids can bring compost and then they can take bags of soil back home to start their window box gardens. I mentioned Miss Juanita. Miss Juanita is 73 years old. Miss Juanita has done so much community service that I'm probably going to have to come up with some kind of award to give her. Right? <laughs> I mean, she's been all over the creek. She's actually a resident that grew up in the creek. She remembers when crawfish and hummingbirds and a pileated woodpecker were all things that she had in her backyard. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons she works so hard to do the restoration work that we do is because she wants to see that stuff come back, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is to support you know, members of the community like Miss Juanita, right? And I, I mentioned that she don't let me get away with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but we do a lot of water quality testing. Um, we formed the Project Creek Stewardship Council in 2018, and uh, that's me. <laughs> so I don't know if there's time for questions. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned grants to get people stipends, yes. or where do you get that money? <laughs> <laughs> right. So a lot of times when uh, I work on grants, especially with um, organizations like the Conservation Fund, they have like. Um, a lot of different multiple revenue streams that come through organizations like that. Um, and so they're able to be a little bit more flexible in how they pass money through. Um, and so the traditional grants, especially the traditional EPA grants, really frown on stipend. Um, but when I work with academic institutions, for example, it's a lot easier to do stipends. It's a lot easier to kind of leverage, um, especially because of um, public health work that people understand that you've got to compensate people for their time. 
and certainly when you work with organizations like the Conservation Fund and others that have maybe fee-for-service monies kind of in their pipeline. And so that money oftentimes you're able to kind of peel off a little bit from so that you can create compensation. Um, because the EPA money doesn't even allow us to, to buy food, right? So if I'm going to have a community meeting under an EPA grant, I have to find somebody like a Whole Foods or somebody, you know, that's going to cover uh, that donation. So again, it, it, you have to be very nimble um, in how you stack the resources that allow you to do the engagement work. Well, how have you learned to um, replicate your, your education programs in other communities? What, what are you, do you have like a, 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 a PowerPoint presentation that's your way, you start here and this is how you get there to use this trajectory? Usually what I do is I try to build um, stewards that take the work right out. So a lot of times what I've been able to leverage really is the AU, um, the Atlanta University Consortium. So Spelman Morehouse and Clark Atlanta University to some extent, um, and then Georgia Tech and Georgia State um, really supplied me with a countless uh, supply of you know, unpaid labor, right? I get a lot of sweat equity from my undergraduate and, and, and graduate interns. And so once we've invested in orientations around the environmental education activity that we'll do, we'll send them to schools and neighborhoods and they'll act as education ambassadors. And so I may send them to a Y. I may send them to after school program. And then they'll continue to facilitate these programs kind of off site. And then we'll invite people to come. Because oftentimes I try to give away the free stuff so that I can get people to come to the nature center, <laughs> you know, and pay, right? And so we can go to a program with a college student and roll out that and say, okay, you could get more if you come hang out with me for the day, you know? And so a lot of that is kind of the marketing approach to kind of tease people with the educational programming. Um, the service learning work is just the stuff that we do um, with whoever wants to do it. So Boy Scout troops, um, Eagle Scouts, Girl Scout troops, other conservation corps. And what's interesting is now you see a, a lot of nonprofits, NGOs that are coming into this space that recognize the importance of urban work and so you have these green teams that are starting to come with groups like Groundworks and others. And so we'll work with them to build up, you know, kind of their capacity to do the work. And so it's almost like, you know, kind of once I created the curriculum, I'm kind of handing it out there, <laughs> you know, and that way I don't have to necessarily have something as proprietary as something like a, you know, you know a canned presentation that I have to do myself. You know, I really want it to be um, very flexible. Once you've created um, some of the programs in the communities that you've dealt with, how have you been able to sustain them long term? That's been a, a, a challenge in that the, the major community that we've supported for the last five years has been the Proctor Creek community. And Proctor Creek has 38 neighborhoods, almost 40 neighborhoods. And so it took a lot to create the scaffolding uh, with other nonprofits. And my preference was that they not be a 501c3, because I really didn't want them to have to figure out how to get the capacity to do their own fundraising and to build you know, their own kind of internal infrastructure, because I know how hard that is. So I really wanted them to stay a loose configuration of neighborhood leaders, and hopefully they would allow me and other groups to support them. Um, and I felt like you know, that left the hard work of the sustainability on me and my partners. Uh, to make sure that they had everything that they needed, but that all they had to worry about was the deployment and the messaging, right? So if I can keep it that way, and, and it'll remain to be seen, you know, if, I mean, because communities want their own autonomy, right? And it's, it's kind of like, you know, once, you know, you kind of have the child, you can't keep, her, keep them at home, right? You, you know, so I know that at some point, you know, this council, is, 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 well, they, they may come back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it, you know, I, I know that I'm going to have to at least understand the desire for autonomy. Um, but my goal would be that they would be continue to be much more nimble um, in their abilities, and it just continues to keep me accountable to them. And the relationship, at least so far for the last five years, has worked out that way. Um, and again, it just keeps me looking for <laughs> alternate sources of grants and revenue generation and project development. I'm creating projects for them all of the time. Because as, I, as we do leadership development, you can't keep showing people the same stuff. You know, you've got to kind of increase 
the capabilities and the work so that you're building their capacity. And so now, you know, we've brought these people to national conferences. Now they're starting to speak on their own and they can kind of handle, you know, making arrangements for themselves. Again, we're getting them into publication and writing articles, you know, maintaining blogs. And so their capacity has really uh, increased significantly, but the sustainability is hard. You know, the sustainability is hard. The idea of place seems very important <coughs> with what you do. The Nature Center, yeah. for example. And the Donebrook Watershed has a established Nature Center. But uh, what I'm thinking of now are uh, groups around Cleveland. For example, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Cleveland that happen to own a derelict industrial ravine that got a nice green infrastructure grant. And here we have a now a new wetland in town that is connected with an established institution that serves inner city youth. Okay? And there's another one that may arise here in a similar vein. So I'm asking if you think that that is a wave of the future, that neighborhood-based centers that can feature a natural feature connected with water as the base around which to draw youth especially yeah. certainly i certainly support that one of the conversations i'm recently having is with a guy named ken Leinbach up in milwaukee and he has an urban ecology center model in milwaukee some of you may be familiar with it but he now has three urban nature centers in milwaukee in different ecosystems so he has a prairie grass nature center he's got a, a nature center that's essentially in a brownfield that's been um restored and then he's got the riverfront uh, nature center but essentially these are highly placed based really intended to work work within a mile a mile and a half radius of the communities so what what that changes in terms of the environmental education experiential education paradigm is that you're not taking people out to some pristine place right you're teaching them that nature exists in their backyards and then you get them to become stewards of the backyard so I certainly agree with you that that is the new shift in thinking, that we don't have to take everyone to the suburbs, right? Or we have, don't have to take everyone to some external place. That certainly can be within uh, uh, a trajectory or a timeline so that you eventually learn that, you know, places like the Tetons or Grand Canyon are certainly other types of ecosystems. But if we only show people that, they don't see what they have as being relevant. And so we really have to start locally to get that understanding. Let's, let's get the young man. Yeah. Do you think thousands of people around the world will know about this? My hope is that they would know. I, I think one of the things that is very difficult in messaging about the environment, and we see this with climate change, is that because we who are scientists and academics use too much jargon, it doesn't feel approachable to people, right? And so I really feel like if we don't start speaking in layman's terms <laughs> about these issues and, and coming up with talking points that people can really understand. Um, we're getting a lot of calls from our brothers and sisters in Africa and Nigeria and places that are experiencing a huge amount of flooding because of climate change. And they really don't know how to implement green infrastructure, right? And so they're really looking at how do they turn these huge, vast acreages of preserves into low impact development that could catch storm water, right? And so I think there's an opportunity to make this a, a national issue, um, but it's going to take creative minds, hopefully like yours, uh, <laughs> that gets us to the point where we can talk about it.